Uh, hey guys, I'm joined here uh, with uh, Carrie Bolden from New Zealand. So, Mr. Bolden, uh, welcome to my show. Thank you, Robert. It's so you, uh, hold, uh, to be on. you hold a doctorate in historical theology and, and theology, and you've been a contributing editor for the Foreign Policy Journal and a fellow of Academy of Social and Political Research in Greece. And your your work has been published in the International Journal of Social Economics, the Journal of Social, uh, Political, and Economic Studies, uh, Geopolitical World Affairs, India Quarterly, and the Initiate uh, Initiate Journal of Traditional Studies, and has been translated into many different languages. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, um, I hold various bits and pieces on um, sociology and psychology, and. Uh, Various religious studies, uh, more for my own um, mental discipline than anything else. I've never actually been part of formal academia in New Zealand, which I regard as, as totally corrupt. Um, but I suppose I am an academic, and so far as I'm a uh, fellow of the Academy of uh, Social and Political Research, uh, based in Athens. And um, you know, I have been widely widely published by the uh, scholarly and uh, broader media. That's correct. So you have a recent book out. It's called uh, "Revolution from Above: Manufacturing Dissent in the New World Order." That's correct. Yes, it uh, came out from Arctos uh, several months ago, and uh, it seems to have been on the best list ever since. So I don't know how many copies that relates to an actual sales, but I'm hoping it's a, a reasonable number, and it's also sold by uh, Alex Kurtajik of uh, Wormod and, Wormod and um, Amazon.com and Barnes and & Noble and various other places. Um, but yes, that's right. So the, the book, it shows that the, the, the main point in the book, that the competition between Marxism and capitalism have been a fallacy, and you say, in fact, they've been in total con conclusion, collusion. Well, my theory, or I don't know whether it's my theory, but I, I hold the belief that capitalism um, operates dialectically, um, much like Marxism, but uh, whereas Marx said that capitalism was a stage, a dialectical stage on the way to uh, first socialism and then world communism, I believe that actually uh, socialism is a dialectical phase on the way to um, a regimented capitalist world collective, collective state, uh, which we you know now generally call globalisation. And um, this theory isn't too far out. Uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski in his 1970 book, Between Two Ages, pretty much states uh, that there is a dialectic in operation and um, uh, the outcome will be a, a sort of technocratic international state of a new technocratic elite and uh, part of the dialectical process has been Marxism. So while, you know, it might sound odd from the usual orthodox historical point of view, even uh, Brzezinski uh, now Brzezinski said much the same thing in 1970, and of course he was, he's been with the Trilateral Commission and the Council on Foreign Relations, and he, he still uh, advises on foreign policy, etc. So um, there is some um, orthodox or establishment historical basis to to what I'm saying as well. Yeah, uh, it's basically uh, a, a funny clash of opposites, which leads um, to, a, to a synthesis, and the synthesis will be. Um, Almost like you have in China on a world scale. I mean, that's a uh, strongly centralised state that operates capitalistically. So I guess we could go start going over the book by the the table of contents has the chapters. I guess. Okay. So what do you you start off with the how, introduction? Introduction. How would you introduce your 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 case? Well, I I start off basically with um, what. Uh, Huxby said, he, he was, I think he was more insightful personally than, um, George Orwell. He, he very, in his brave new world, he very much, uh, described what is now taking place today and, uh, described the sort of society which we are now getting, um, which is not one of obvious servitude, but one of, um, servitude by, uh, soft approach, almost, uh, being, 
and an narcotic state um, with consumerism and uh, and drugs and um, hedonism, etc. So we, you know, serves basically without realising it. Um, and I, I then state that this collectivist idea is sort of traced back to Plato. Um, 375 BC, he uh, wrote The Republic, you know, which isn't to say that Plato as a philosopher is all, all bad, but it's just that he laid down a collectivist uh, state thousands of years ago, and, and he referred to feminism and uh, gender equality and, and um, this type of thing that we now regard as progressive. He was going on about that sort of thing uh, several thousand years ago. So what we're seeing now is the culmination of various trends and thoughts which have been floating around for, for several thousand years. And, uh, you know, the, the term progressive is a bit of a, a misnomer. As Spengler pointed out, things are cyclic. So what's taking place now has happened in, in Rome and Greece and other civilizations um, in their own uh, similar cycles. And we're in, a, of course, a cycle of decay. Uh, just as Rome, etc., was, and we're going through the same, the same uh, things for the same purposes and uh, controlled by very similar people, oligarchs, uh, basically. So, what do you mean by capital? You say capitalist and Marxist uh, dialects. Yeah, a dialectic, you know, the Marxist dialectic, which says that there's a history precedes, well, Marx called it the, the wheel of history, it precedes. Uh, Dialectically, through a clash of opposites, and um, he had a basically a lineal cycle of from prim, what he called uh, primitive to uh, modern, starting starting off with the uh, primitive communism, then going on to feudalism, uh, capitalism, then um, socialism, and eventually world communism, and um, from the clash of various classes in each of these cycles, a, a next step will emerge. Um, whereas I state that there's a capitalist dialectic which uh, states that Marxism isn't the final product, it's just a phase, or socialism in general is just a phase towards a uh, capitalist uh, outcome. And uh, that's what I try to document in the book. I think it's got a, something like 800 uh, footnoted references there, uh, so there is a, a bit of evidence uh, for what I'm saying. So you see this as all kind of planned out and well organized, rather than just sort of a trend. Well, uh, you know, people are sort of horrified by the word conspiracy now, but uh, I mean, we accept that the mafia is a criminal conspiracy going back, well, virtually since the medieval era, in a you know continuous line, and that uh, achieved great political and economic power. And we accept that the Fuggy in India was a uh, both a criminal and a religious conspiracy that uh, lasted for hundreds of years. Um, and yet, when we mention words like Freemasons, Zionists, capitalists, and um, mention that they may be planning some sort of agenda, long-term agenda in their own interests, well, yet the orthodox academics and uh, skeptics are uh, crying, "Well, conspiracy theory! What you know? What a lot of paranoid nonsense!" But uh, you know, the, the media even talks about uh, Scientology as a virtual conspiracy, so I don't see anything implausible about people like uh, David Rockefeller or George Soros uh, meeting in rather secret conclaves and, um, if not deciding on a specific agenda, at, at least arriving at a uh, consensus of the direction of where to go. But so I wouldn't say conspiracy is the whole story. I, I'm not a reductionist. Um, I think there's variables in any given situation. And I think we should, although it's not really covered in the book, we should um, look back to Spengler, um, who states that um, civilization goes through various cycles, ending in a cycle where money uh, rules. And um, without the cycle of decay, these plutocratic interests wouldn't have the power they do in the first place. So it's a, I think it's not a matter of um, matters assuming um, a conspiratorial conclusion, whereas uh, as in um, the door has been opened by the cycle of decadence um, to the international plutocrats.
And with with Huck, you talk about Huxley's Brave New World. You think he, you think he was in on something, or you think he just, you think it was a prediction, or you think he knew about a lot of? Well, he was. He, he went to America and he was involved with American academia and um, with Timothy Leary, etc. Um, he certainly seems to have had first-hand experience of what was uh, taking place, and I'm I'm not too sure. Um, whether he was actually in favour of or, for, or opposed to it. He, he is certainly a um, advocate of um, narcotics and the opening of so-called doors of perception with um, narcotics, whereas in Brave New World he talks about narcotics being a means of uh, controlling people, what he called, he, he uses the word soma there for some sort of narcotic. And... Um, uh, in relation to that, we had LSD, of course, with uh, people like Timothy very um, promoting that, and he in turn was promoted by some very uh, powerful interests. So you you say that, then you say abolishing abolishing the family is one of the primary obstacles to uh, tyranny. Oh, very much so, abolishing the family, because um, uh, you know the collectivist state requires law, total loyalty and of course uh, the most primal loyalty is to one's family so um, the co collectivist state or a, a dictatorship tries to undermine anything which um, is a hindrance to uh, that total loyalty and um, you know we see it in the communistic doctrines one of the first things the uh, Bolsheviks tried to do was to abolish the family and of course that didn't work and uh, Stalin reversed the whole process, he, he put the uh, Soviet Union on a footing that was um, probably less Marxist than uh, the United States, and um, also you trace it back also to the Illuminati um, in Germany in the 18th century, uh, one of their policies was the destruction of the family, and uh, from there also, once again, uh, Plato uh, talked about surrendering children to the care of the state, virtually the sort of um, child care centres that we have today, and uh, combining women, male and female, into a universal workforce. So uh, definitely uh, breaking down the family has been a major um, part of the agenda of any uh, collectivist. And I think the other, I think the things people have is kind of their identity and their the the unit they're in there. You have your family, you have your religion, you have yes. your ethnicity, your nationality. Yes. And yes. I think all those things they kind of see as potential uh, obstacles to them. Yes, definitely. Uh, any, anything that separates people that causes diversity. I mean, they they're trying to impose a uniform. Equality, um, using the, the term diversely, but you know the outcome is actually quite the reverse. So I, I guess uh, I think it was all will will have called it the double speak or double think or something of the sort. And, and um, once again, it works dialectically. Um, it's uh, in regard to the, the racial matter and the matter of immigration. It's not a, a subject I cover um, in detail in my book, but it might be the subject of a um, a book coming out this year. Um, multiculturalism is very much so a part of the agenda. As you say, of breaking down the concept of nation uh, nationality, anything that any boundary that gets in the way of a uh, universal shopping mall and a universal uh, factory, basically. So you say, what exactly do you mean when you you say revolution from above? Well, it's a revolution that's controlled from the top downwards. I mean, you, you normally think of a revolution being, you know, the stirring of the masses from below, uh, overthrowing tyranny and uh, establishing their own democratic uh, republic, whereas, in fact, often it's more of the case that these masses are being directed and man manipulated and uh, funded by the people they think they're actually opposing. I mean, in France... Um, you know, when they stormed the Bastille, instead of releasing thousands of prisoners, I, I think there was something like half a dozen there, and uh, but, uh, it wasn't, we were told that, you know, they were overthrowing such a great tyranny, but uh, what they got instead was a, a tyranny of far worse proportions, and uh, that was very much part of a conspiratorial apparatus to, um, involving masonry and uh, funding from the uh, Duke of Orleans, etc., so that was part, you know, the culmination of uh, many generations of uh, 
planning the same with the Bolsheviks. They were very much um, controlled or, or directed um, by plutocratic interests. They thought they were uh, trying to overthrow. So it's very much a case of manipulating people from above into doing the exact opposite of what they suppose they're doing. And then you say revolution by stealth. Yes, uh, Fabianism, gradualism, uh, something quite different from the uh, bloody upheaval of the French or uh, Russian revolutions. Um, and uh, that's the, the main modus operandi of the uh, present agenda. You know, the, the Velvet Revolutions are a typical example of what's taking place now in the, the so-called Hour of Spring that everyone's uh, getting um, joyous about. And... Um, you know, that started off with Fabianism in uh, England, and uh, a rather odd um, factor of that was that the London School of Economics was started by the Fabian Society by um, Beatrice and uh, Sidney Webb, and they mentioned that um, they got funding for this from the Rothschilds and Sir Ernest Cassell, who was in Kun Lube and Company, and uh, Maxim Vickers Armaments, and uh, the Rockefellers, and um, the Rockefellers continue to um, fund the London School of Economics, and uh, I think Sir Ernest Cassell um, has a chair of business named after him, and uh, so I think it was Cassell it? who, I'm sorry? Go ahead, I'll go ahead. I'll yeah, I, I think it was Cassell who actually mentioned that the London School of Economics was going to be the socialist training ground of the um, future technocratic hierarchy, and one wonders why a, an arch-capitalist would be... Um, uh, praising something that's going to be the training ground for a, a socialist hierarchy. So, and from there, of course, in America, uh, that was transplanted um, into bodies such as the League for Industrial Democracy and um, uh, from the, uh, the the New School of Economics and social uh, the New School of Social Research and um, you know a, a whole vast network that virtually dominates the uh, university system in America and uh, well, much of the rest of the world really. So then the next one is revolution by degeneracy. Yes, well, um, the, that represents basically what the what culminated in the New Left and the so-called youth revolt, and um, it was basically a coalescing of, of various trends and uh, studies and schools of thought, including uh, Kinsey's uh, Sexology, which was funded by the Rockefeller Foundation and, and continues to be funded largely by the Ford Foundation, and uh, um, music, um, you know, you had... Uh, the music, the music institutes, what was it called? It was, um, called the Radio Project, founded them at Princeton in 1937 and staffed by uh, socialists of the Frankfurt School being imported from Germany and uh, funded by Rockefellers. And also you had the, the arts um, being pushed by organisations such as the CIA's Congress, Congress for Cultural Freedom, etc. And all of us saw these movements sort of... Uh, coalesced into the New Left during the 1960s and the specific uh, organisation that was primarily the impetus for that was the Institute for Policy Studies which was founded in 1963 and the, uh, the main funder of that was James Warburg of the Warburg Banking Dynasty and that continues to be funded today by uh, Ford and Turner and Rockefeller and um, from here you had a sort of a, a tie-up and emanations um, that led to the Students for a Democratic Society and um, it was during the Cold War, of course, and the CIA was very much involved with um, planning and funding alternative, alternative socialist organisations um, to the Soviet Union, so you had them establishing and well, funding the uh, National Union of Students and the International Union of Socialist Youth, and uh, from here, Gloria Steinem, uh, you know, got her start, and, and she was promoted by uh, Catherine Graham Mayer from the Washington Post and uh, Falcon from the uh, connections with the CIA and the, the publishing industry. So. Um, there's so much that ties up, you know. I mean, I think any anyone that researches this this sort of thing, you know, they start becoming um, 
uh, engrossed in a, a sort of web of, of uh, organisations and people that interlock and they, they go from one thing to the other and you almost think, is it ever going to end? And of course, I don't think it ever does end. There's always some group that's propping up, um, you know, to address some new situation like the various organisations that are now involved with um, so-called Islamofascism, you know, and that, that's uh, spawned a whole new uh, group of pressure groups. So we're talking about something quite fast here, and it's all quite, you know, easy to research if you've got the, the time to do it, you know. So what does he mean by you say the new left from old? I knew this from old. Well, you know, of course, um, the old left was based on the, the workers rising in, in the proletarian revolution that would overthrow the establishment, so supposedly. Um, and, of course, the working class seem, or tend to be the most conservative element of, of any population in a country. So uh, the um, the establishment, uh, you know, the, the plutocrats thought, well, we have to start looking at um, other um, factions that can be maybe revolutionised better than what the um, working class could ever be. So they zeroed in on... Um, various minorities, and when those minor minorities don't exist, they create grievances and create minorities. So, um, you know, you've, you've got a whole new left based not on the working class, but on, um, you know, gay rights, women's rights, um, children's rights is the latest one. You know, there's always something that can break down society and traditional social structures. So uh, um, that's basically what... Um, you know, the old left is sort of redundant now in terms of uh, how it serves the um, plutocrats. Yeah, then the new, you're saying that also with the new left on the economics, they've sort of abandoned the working class and mm. more, and then in a lot of ways kind of colluded with uh, big corporations. Oh, very much so. Yeah, yeah. A lot of these um, issues are funded by the, the corporations. I think um, Betty Friedan was. Um, if I remember rightly, well sponsored by, uh, you know, corporations to lecture on how women can uh, best serve the workforce. Well, you know, how revolutionary is that? I mean, I think uh, Pat Buchanan mentioned that, you know, there's this um, collusion between feminism and uh, and big capital because both are against the uh, concept of the family and both want to integrate woman fully into the workforce. So, you know, so-called woman's liberation is a complete misnomer. They are being liberated from their own family just to be uh, served to the um, capitalist system, you know, which is a bit ironic when you, you consider that a lot of these uh, feminists, etc., are supposed to be against the capitalist system. So you'd think that they would want to askew that system and, um, you know, have women dedicate themselves to the family. So it's just another example of how um, how things are used for a wider long term interest. So, what are what are the scenarios for crisis and control? Well, the the tactic of the um, plutocrats, or what uh, Huxley called the world controllers, is to basically create an, a crisis, then come up with a solution. You know, and. Um, uh, you know, you've got environmentalism, you've got the, the green issues and the, the uh, global warming, and, I mean, these may well be, you know, all very legitimate uh, concerns, but uh, what the plutocrats come up with are uh, um, solutions such as green, you know, credits, and uh, where they can make a bloody good uh, profit from, uh, from all this, such as... Um, uh, you know, there's green banks and green trading and, um, you know, all this sort of carry on. Uh, and then, you know, there's uh, talk of um, establishing a world population authority. Uh, someone called Simon Linnett of uh, NM Rothschild. Uh, uh, hold on a, a second, please. Yes, certainly. Uh, it's time for a break now. Uh, please stay with us. Uh, welcome back. I'm joined here with uh, Kerry Bolden. We're talking about his book, uh, Revolution from Above. So is there anything else you'd like to add about the kind of these crises and the, that they kind of exploit? And you talk about stuff like global warming, how it is it could be it could very well be a legit it's a legitimate issue, but that they're kind of exploiting these crises for th their agenda. 
Yeah, that's right. You've got organisations such as the Club of Rome saying that there's overpopulation and that we need uh, more government controls to uh, limit that population. So, you know, how are they going to limit a world population by obviously uh, introducing introducing all sorts of draconian measures and ultimately the, the suggestion always seems to revolve around some sort of international system. So, um, you know, there's all these crisis scenarios of their own making and, uh, you know, a uh, prime one is the... Uh, the, the um, crisis with debt, I mean, that crisis is because there's a flaw in the financial system and um, they created it and now they come up with wonderful new solutions about belt tightening and uh, and getting further into debt, etc. So um, it's all really part of a, uh, quite a farce, really. So then what is, what is global demo, democratic revolution? Well, that refers to the revolutions that we're seeing with the so-called Arab Spring and uh, the Velvet Revolutions in the former Soviet states. And um, once again, that, that involves a plethora of um, groups such as the International Republican Institutions, uh, Freedom House and uh, USAID, the uh, Soros, George Soros Networks and uh, the National um, Endowment for Democracy, which was actually founded by a um, Trotskyite, Tom Kahn of the American Federation of Labor in 1983 with uh, State Department backing. Um, and basically, I, I regard American foreign policy and uh, the backing of world revolution as akin to Trotskyism. And it so happens that the neocons and the organizations like uh, um, the National Endowment for Democracy um, were they have leaders and founders who were actually started, who actually started off as Trotskyites, and such was their hatred for the Soviet Union that uh, many, many of them became cold warriors. Um, even um, Leon Trotsky's widow Natalie um, Sadova. Um, broke from the Fourth International over the question of um, backing America and Korea. She became a, an avid Cold Warrior because she regarded uh, the Soviet Union under Stalin as the major obstacle to uh, world communism and uh, the United States is the best way of destroying that obstacle. And uh, you had the same thing with uh, Professor Sidney Hook, uh, an apologist for uh, Leon Trotsky, who um, actually ended up getting the uh, US Medal of Freedom uh, under Reagan. Um, you know, so many of these neocons started off as Trotskyites uh, through simple hatred of uh, a Soviet Union without their uh, beloved Trotsky. I think that's kind of the, well. That's kind of the view of the the that group called the they're called the National Bolsheviks, where they actually believe that Stalin was a nationalist, and that I mean they obviously they believe that the Trotskyites were a lot were a lot worse. Yeah, I'd go along with that, basically. I think Trotsky was a um, complete lickspittle to international capital. And um, uh, Professor of History at, I think it was Idaho State University, Richard Spence, um, he wrote several articles in scholarly magazines detailing the way Trotsky was sort of used and um, funded and directed all around the world, pretty much. And um, they Trotsky was basically the man of international capital, whether he realised it or not. Um, he was very close to uh, British security for forces in, in Russia and um, and Armand Hammer made the comment that he would get, he visited Trotsky, he interviewed Trotsky and uh, they got along very well and uh, Trotsky assured Hammer that um, in the event of uh, big capital going into Soviet Russia, would actually be protected by the, the Bolsheviks. Uh, whereas Hammer comments that after Stalin came to power, um, no business could be done really at all. So um, uh, I'd say pretty much that Stalin reversed Bolshevism and set Russia on a uh, um, you know, nationalistic and pan-Slavic path. And of course, Trotsky himself and the revolution of the trades states pretty much the same thing. You know, uh, Stalin instituted programs to um, protect the family and um, promote, uh, you know, more children, etc. Uh, he reversed the old uh, Bolshevik policies about trying to uh, create equality with the, in the armed forces and, the, and all these other ridiculous uh, 
um, endeavours that you know are, are impossible of being carried out. So you ended up with basically a national state, um, and uh, the Cold War basically developed from um, Stalin's repudiation of an American proposal to uh, form a world government through the United Nations General Assembly and to internationalise. Uh, atomic energy through the uh, Baruch plan, which the Soviets recognised were just poised for United States uh, global domination. I'd like to get back to, to the little bit to the topic of the Cold War, but I guess we'll c- conclude the, the chapters of the books. The last uh, chapter is the total, total world planning. Please explain what total world planning is. Oh, well, uh, it's really paraphrasing... Um, Nelson Rockefeller stating that he believes in total world planning, which really amounts to uh, world socialism, you know, under another name. And um, that is what the ultimate aim of the plutocrats is to create a world which is tightly organised um, and their, uh, their profits, uh, you know, are not hindered by um, boundaries such as uh, nation, ethnicity, family. You know, uh, that's just... Uh, what Huxley called, you know, basically world, the world controls. So I guess it's basically the what, what some people call the New World Order. Well, it's the New World Order. I'm sure that is what people call the New World Order and uh, what both Presidents Bush uh, termed the New World Order, yes. So you, talk about, you, you, also, you also talk about sort of figures and historical figures who've really challenged this uh, this well, I don't know if you call it a, whether you call it a conspiracy or agenda, and mm. also kind of people who've presented an alternative yeah. to uh, both capitalism and socialism, and you also talk about breaking the bonds of usury. And mm, who, yes. who are some of? The, I guess start off talking by some of these individuals uh, living to, today, and also the historical figures. Uh, yeah, certainly. Uh, well, you know for. One thing I'd say that uh, nothing really can be done until the uh, the power of the bankers through the use of the big um, finance system can be broken. Whether you're talking about race, immigration, or any other factor, whatever state comes into power, which is ostensibly nationalist, will not be able to do a damn thing until they have um, financial and economic sovereignty over their own banking system and. Uh, well, Ezra Pound, um, he wrote a series of booklets during the 1930s and 1940s, uh, which explains the system quite cogently. And uh, he was also a fascist because he viewed fascism as an attempt to break the power of the international financiers, which, uh, I mean, most social creditors wouldn't regard that too kindly, um, you know, being identified with fascism. But um, uh, I listened to a, a program, an interview you had with, um, Greg Johnson recently, and uh, he said he wishes that there's some cogent expressions of uh, social credit, and uh, Ezra Pound's little booklets are actually very cogent expressions of that. And um, others who are still going are the Australian League of Rights, which has been going, going since, um, I think, the 1930s. Um, uh, they are based on social credit, and... Uh, they put out a number of publications, including online publications, which explain social credit quite uh, cogently. And uh, the Social Credit Secretariat in England is the original organisation founded by C.H. Douglas. That's still going and, and uh, producing uh, interesting books on the subject. And one of the most zealous and impressive, I think, is the Pilgrims of St. Michael in Canada, which was founded in the 1930s. That's Catholic-based because uh, social credit is seen by many traditional Catholics as, as the means of um, achieving Catholic social doctrine because of the opposition to us- usury. But um, one of the most interesting uh, alternatives to the orthodox finance was uh, in Quebec in 1685 um, when France was bankrupt and uh, the French governor... Um, he wasn't getting any more uh, money or funds from France during that period. And uh, so he gathered in all the playing cards of Quebec and uh, cut them into quarters and um, wrote a denomination on those cards and put playing cards into circulation. And uh, that actually saved Quebec from bankruptcy. And uh, ironically, um, you know, a 100 years later, 
you know, when the French Revolution came along, um, the French government uh, was paying 50% of its expenditure uh, for debt. So, you know, maybe if they had taken a lesson from Quebec and started um, cutting out playing cards, they might have saved their heads somewhat. Um, but that shows that really um, credit, you know, there's nothing more than a means of exchange. There's nothing particularly magical about it, but uh, under the present system, it's being treated as a profit-making commodity uh, via interest or usury, whereas it should just be the oil of commerce, just a means, uh, and a, a convenient means of exchanging goods and services. And uh, others in, in America were Lewis, uh, Congressman Lewis T. McFadden was very much uh, an opponent of, of international finance and uh, declared on the floor um, of the House's opposition to the Reserve Yeah, you, Bank, you, you mentioned this, but I have to emphasize, you say all these other problems like immigration and, and job outsourcing and foreign policy, <laughs> they all go back to the control that the, the bankers have over our countries. That's right. That's, that's their key to well control, basically. The, the way they can virtually create credit out of nothing and charge interest on it. And, of course, you know, that's, uh, that's evolved into an entire international system through the International Monetary Fund and the World Banks and the various international banks and the, uh, the situation um, the world finds itself in now. And, um, you know, the, the solution proposed by the international bankers is for countries simply to pour money into the International Monetary Fund so they can revend it to other countries. I mean, well, I don't quite see the sentiment myself. I mean, uh, John Kennedy, I believe, started issuing uh, treasury notes and circumvented the Federal Reserve System. Uh, that was straight out state credit. Uh, prior to him, you know, people talk about Lincoln's greenbacks, but you also had the Confederate greybacks based on a uh, cotton standard. And, uh, you know, a lot of um, theories to the contrary, the uh, Confederacy definitely wasn't a tool of international finance, and in fact, they couldn't get a damn thing. Well, they got one loan of $2.5 million at 7% from the Erlanger Bank, and um, um, the much benigned, um, who was the, um, the, the Secretary of State, uh, Judith P. Benjamin, he regarded that as outright usury. You know, uh, Benjamin is called a, an agent of the Rothschilds and even a relative of the Rothschilds, but he was actually uh, very much a patriotic southerner, and uh, um, the South didn't get any diplomatic re recognition, and they didn't get anything apart from this 2.5 million. Their, their um, expenditure was based on state credit, based on the yeah, cotton standard, that, it was called Greyback. Is, well, I think uh, one of the major myths that the Confederacy was a tool of the yes. Rothschilds, I think the other one is that the, like, the other myth going around is that the Nazis were. Yes, well, that largely, well, that, funnily enough, largely stems from C.H. Douglas, who um, regarded Hitler as a tool of international bankers, um, international Jewish bankers, and... Um, well, C.H. Uh, sort of, Douglas said that about Hitler. Sorry? Yes, he, he did. He's he very much anti-Nazi, and he, he regarded the concept of uh, full employment as inevitably uh, leading to war. And I'd have to agree that uh, concept of full employment is... Uh, it's not a necessity. It might be a social or moral necessity, but it's not an economic necessity. But, uh, yeah, that was a view that uh, was held by um, C.H. Douglas and, of course, you know, Anthony Sutton also um, wrote uh, Hitler, and, what was it, Hitler and Wall Street, or a book named something to that extent, um, saying that Hitler was founded, uh, funded by people like Henry Ford and Tyson and Krupp, etc. But... Uh, I mean, you know, as you would expect, uh, there are patriotic and industrialists, so yeah, they're going to maybe, if you're lucky, um, put some money your way, but um, the, the, the uh, major factor to look at is the banking system of National Socialist Germany, and uh, that issue, issued uh, state credit. Um, and so, so the did, National Socialist banking system, was there usury, or was it, what kind of, how, how did that system work? Uh, well, I, I mainly know the, the aspect of state credit. Uh, I'm not certain whether private banks could still lend, but I, I would think that if they could, they would be doing so as, as um, agencies of the state bank. Um, so Japan, that, sorry? that was the, one of the reasons that there was economic prosperity. It is. It's the major reason, and also the other reason was um, 
barter. They they went out of the um, international trading system and went on to barter and were starting to uh, take over the uh, export markets of Central Europe and South America. And um, uh, soon after the war, well, I think when the war was actually still being um, undertaken, um, Roosevelt uh, commented Churchill um, isn't the uh, um, issue of Germany taking over export markets one of the major reasons for the war. Um, and he, he said that was recorded by his son, uh, Elliot Roosevelt. Uh, I think it was a, a book called As He Saw It or something, you know, of a similar name. So, uh, you know, the, the war was very much uh, um, the product of wanting to destroy Germany's um, economic system. And uh, Japan was um, also adopted a, a state credit system. But um, C.H. Douglas was actually very I mean, Japan popular. Japan has... Yeah. I mean, Japan, I think they may have something like that today. Well, they, there's a, it's all, you know, a, a very similar corporate system that they had during the war where, where they've maintained a uh, very close relationship between private enterprise, private banks, and the state. So, you know, you, all these Southeast Asian and Asian countries that were um, noted for their prosperity after the war did so not through free enterprise but through very much a protected market and uh, state intervention. But I'd also like to comment on what New Zealand, uh, New Zealand, I should say, uh, excuse the New Zealand accent, but um, in 1936, um, the Labor, first Labor government nationalised the Reserve Bank, uh, which had been created several years before, basically like the um, Federal Reserve as a means by which international finance could control the um, banking system. But that was nationalised in 1936, and the government started issuing Reserve Bank credit at 1% interest, and they used that to fund the state housing project, which in New Zealand is a very famous, iconic program. With that one program, they uh, eliminated 75% of the unemployed during the Depression here. And that was done entirely with state credit. Um, and it was done without inflation and all the other uh, uh, red herrings that the orthodox economists, uh, you know, raise objections to. Um, and it was, you know, and the state houses in New Zealand are well built. They're on quarter acre sections and uh, they're still enduring. And of, of course, while the New Zealand government is flapping around in incredible debt, no one dares look at what the uh, Labour government did in 1936 with the uh, Reserve Bank credit. And um, Canada was issuing state credit right up until the 1970s. In, in the 1970s, it was still the credit and, and circulation was still 30% state credit, and prior to that time it was uh, mostly state credit. Back to the issue of the Cold War, you've written about, you've written about Soviet and Zionism and the American right, and you've written a lot about Francis Parker Yockey yes. and how he sort of he saw the Soviet Union as a lesser of evils to the, the American American imperialism and capitalism. Yes, very much so. I'd, I'd uh, you know, totally endorse what he says, basically. I mean, you know, to be quite frank, uh, the American system has been a complete curse upon the entire world, and, you know, soon may it fall. Um, uh, but I think uh, Yockey was well ahead of his, his time, and I note that um, today, um, you know, one can write of the Soviet Union and fairly sympathetic terms, and it doesn't really create much of a disturbance amongst uh, American rightists. So I think the American right um, has come a long way since the, uh, you know, the American right of the Cold War era, where they saw the, the Soviet Union as the big threat and people saw the America as the, um, you know, the custodian of freedom, uh, although that's the way that the American you know, establishment still wants to present itself, you know, relative to the so-called world on terror. But, uh, you know, I mean, I think the overriding factor in looking at the Soviet Union was that Stalin rejected the two primary factors in trying to establish a new world order way back in, uh, you know, 19, uh, the late 1940s, and that was, as I said, the United Nations General Assembly as a um, 
the well, the Jura world government, I suppose, and the uh, Baruch plan, which is named after you know Bernard Baruch, the, the international banker for the internationalisation of uh, atomic energy. And um, Gromyko wrote in his uh, memoirs uh, specifically stating that the Soviet Union regarded this as just an American uh, scam for creating their own global domination. And so, I, think, uh, yeah, yeah, I want to mention with Yaki, he's, he's oh, root for on the, he originally was involved with the America First movement, and I guess he identified more with the right. What really made him become change? I mean, he kind of parted with a lot of other, other people on the Cold War issue. What really made him become kind of uh, disfacted with the United States? Well, the... Um the Trump treason trials um, against the hierarchy of the uh, Czech Communist Party were a defining factor for uh, Yoki and um, the uh, the Czech regime. When they uh, they tried these um, people, they accused them. You know, one of the accusations was that they are Zionists working for uh, American Jews and. Um, I don't know how true it is, but uh, apparently Yoki actually attended the Prague treason trials and uh, observed firsthand. And, um, you know, he regarded really what Trotsky had been saying from the start, that uh, Stalin had repudiated Bolshevism and uh, set out on the path of uh, pan-Stalinism and, and socialism in one country. And, uh, of course, uh, the Soviet Union represented the um, major obstacle to what Yoki regarded as the American Jewish regime. So it was basically a, a matter of backing a you know the the one force in the world that was re and I guess a America. lot of the other a lot of the third positionists like some of the ones in France I forget I forget the name of the person but they well, kind of Christian Boucher Christian Boucher that could be him and he's yeah. they saw kind of the effects of American culture had on Western Europe. They, I mean, they felt that American culture was more destructive on Western Europe, and it also ties in with the immigration issue and multi the immigration stuff, but they, they kind of felt that, the, ironically, in Eastern Europe, the cultures and the ethnic makeup of those countries were more intact under communism than Western Europe was under the American sphere. Yes, well, um, you know, one of the um, defining articles of the Soviet Union was uh, by a, 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 a chap called Chernoff writing in the Bolshevik, which was the uh, journal of the Bolshevik Party um, just after the Second World War, I think it was 1948 or, or 49, and um, he was describing in detail what he referred to, and, and he was doing so at the behest basically of, of Stalin, as uh, the rootless cosmopolitanism of American culture. And you read through uh, Chernoff's article, and he, he's really um, decrying internationalist culture and praising um, the folk culture of the Russian people. You know, it's, it's one of the most un-Bolshevik or un-Marxist articles on culture, I think, that you could possibly read. Uh, uh, thoroughly nationalistic and uh, folkish, and he's decrying America as the uh, main, the, the, you know, the world base of uh, cultural contamination and globalism, and he was condemning other Russian uh, cultural figures who he regarded as uh, cosmopolitans. But the Soviet Union was very much aware of culture being used as a weapon, and at about the same time, once again, 1948-49, uh, the CIA and um, Rockefellers, etc., established the um, Congress for Cultural Freedom for the specific purpose of exporting all this, uh, you know, garbage, especially abstract expressionism, and um, you know they regarded it as a means of, um, obviously, of, of destroying the, the national foundations of a state. Uh, we're we're out of time, but I'd like to thank you for being on. Well, it's, uh, it's been good to be on. Thank you. Uh, that's all we have for tonight. So take care, and we're back with you next time.